The term cult classic gets tossed around a little too much, but is it really always justified? On occasion, a movie is so poorly made that it finds its way into the cult classic conversation by way of the so bad it's great loophole. More often than not, so bad just means they're actually terrible films, kinda like the ones on this list. Children of the Corn Adapted from Stephen King's short story, Children of the Corn takes place in an isolated Nebraska town and follows a child-led religious cult hell-bent on ensuring that the town's corn crop remains robust. Of course, they have to sacrifice all of the adults to make that happen. The last bit bodes poorly for an out-of-town couple driving through their fields. We must sacrifice them both tonight. Amos will satisfy him. We need the woman. She'll bring the man to us. No. So, what went wrong with Children of the Corn? King tried to adapt it for the big screen himself, but the author's moody, character-driven screenplay was tossed aside in favor of George Goldsmith's ludicrous, hyper-violent, narratively flimsy take on the tale. Even if some of the film's imagery still colors the pop culture landscape, Children of the Corn is a stagnant and ugly film to look at, leading us to question just how this film managed to inspire its own straight-to-video franchise. Grandma's Boy there's no accounting for taste when you're talking about cult classics. Still, every once in a while, a film claims cult status that just makes you want to hold people accountable. Case in point, 2006's stoner comedy Grandma's Boy. Understand that we're using the word comedy loosely here, because there's really not much to laugh at in this tale of a 35-year-old slacker forced to move in with his grandma. Realistically, there are only about four actual jokes in Grandma's Boy, and the film simply recycles them over and over and over again. What's in here? Uh, it's just the kids in their break room. Or as I call it, the stupid idiot room. We get it. They smoke a lot of pot, play a lot of video games, and that one guy acts like a robot. What else you got? The answer is a resounding nothing. The Room. In 2003, Tommy Wiseau unleashed The Room on the world, and almost in spite of itself, it's become a bona fide cult sensation over the years. James Franco even took on the feature-length reenactment of what went on behind the scenes with the disaster artist. We can't help but be a little worried that people are taking Wiseau's disaster piece seriously. Wiseau's tale of a good man losing it all looks and feels like a no-budget TV show from the early 90s. The dialogue is often unintelligible, and the acting is embarrassingly over the top. I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. To make matters worse, it doesn't look like any of the cast, save for Wiseau, has a clue what's going to happen from one moment to the next. We get it. Everyone loves to watch a disaster. But that doesn't mean the disaster deserves to be celebrated. Showgirls. So you've got a friend who read a book that says Paul Verhoeven's 1995 sexploitation satire Showgirls is a misunderstood masterpiece? No, I mean, what kind of turn was that? Do a PK turn! Huh. That's it. With all due respect to your friend, here are three irrefutable facts that prove just how bad Showgirls is. One, Kyle MacLachlan is still shocked by just how bad it turned out. In a 2012 interview, he admitted to being gobsmacked after seeing it. Two, Elizabeth Berkley, a trained dancer in real life, gave up dancing for years after the film's release. Three, Showgirls basically ended the career of Berkeley, as well as screenwriter Joe Esterhaz, who was one of Hollywood's hottest writers at the time. Although one could argue Verhoeven was brilliant to exploit the script's ridiculous plot and misguided sense of feminism, its record-setting run at the 1995 Razzie Awards proves our point. Dune there's not a filmmaker on this list with more cult cred than David Lynch, but even the famed auteur couldn't cult his way into bringing a successful version of Frank Herbert's sci-fi novel Dune to the big screen. Lynch's big-budget debut hit theaters in 1984 and was immediately marked as an epic misfire by critics. In his one-star review of the film, Roger Ebert stated, This movie is a real mess, one of the most confusing screenplays of all time. If you've sat through all two hours and 20 minutes of the film yourself, you know it's true. Though Lynch shoulders much of the blame, he's not entirely at fault. Dune was, after all, just his third feature film as director. After small-scale successes with Eraserhead and The Elephant Man, Dune was a dramatic shift in both scale and story for Lynch, maybe a little too big. Matters only got worse in post-production when financiers wrestled control of Dune away from Lynch. The result was an absolute mess of a film, the sort of mess that makes us wonder whether its cult classic status isn't merely a reflection on the man who directed it. Mommy Dearest even if you haven't seen Bizarro 1981 melodrama Mommy Dearest, you can almost certainly quote its most famous line. No war! 
Please trust us when we advise you to leave your exposure to Mommy Dearest to that singular moment, because the rest of the film only gets weirder, and not in a good way. Part soap opera drama and part psychological horror film, Mommy Dearest takes its story from a memoir penned by Joan Crawford's adopted daughter Christina. At the center of it all is a performance from Faye Dunaway that can only be described as really really big. So big, it ends up dwarfing the work of everyone she shared the screen with. It's the sort of performance that most directors would beg an actor to tone down. Unfortunately, Mommy Dearest director Frank Perry let Dunaway run with it, and she ran his film right into the realm of caustic, unwatchable camp. Howard the Duck Howard the Duck was destined to claim cult classic status before cameras even rolled, mostly because the Marvel comic that spawned it was the very definition of cult fiction. At the center of the comic was a wise-cracking, cigar-chomping, kung-fu-fighting fowl who goes by the name of Howard. Fly away! <laughs> no one laughs at a master of quack-fu! <laughs> Yes, Howard the Duck is every bit as bonkers as it sounds. It was produced as a live-action feature, even though director William Hugh believed it would work better as animation. The film's producer, George Lucas, was the one who insisted that the project go ahead with bold, practical effects and, um, a dwarf in a duck suit. We're pretty sure Lucas regretted that decision once Howard the Duck was finished. The seemingly ready-made cult classic proved an absolute eyesore of a film.